right, so let's wrap up our conversation about getting information into our memories with a nice treatment of mnemonic devices. So mnemonic is a Latin term, hence the strangely silent M at the beginning. Um, it's not mnemonic. For some reason, people pronounce it like pneumonia, but there's no U in mnemonic. It's just E. Mnemonic. This is these are devices that will aid in memory. Some people call them memory tricks, but I don't think they're tricks if they actually work. Like tricks would make you think they work when they really don't. These really work. These actually enhance memory. Um, so this first one has lots of different names. Uh, I was taught that it's called the method of loci, and loci is plural of locus, and locus means location. <laughs> So you can imagine why people might have wanted to get away from such a complicated name um, and they start calling this a memory palace or a memory castle. Um, so you may have seen these uh, people on the internet on YouTube videos and things explain how to use this technique. I'll show you how to use it to memorize a very simple shopping list. So I'm going to start off in the Brady Bunch kitchen and I don't know why this is the kitchen I imagine. I, I go to the Brady Bunch house for some reason. For those of you who are really young you're like what's that? Um, but it was a sitcom that was in reruns when I was a child and I watched it all the time and when I was first introduced to this concept they said picture a two-story house and even though I lived in a two-story house for some reason the first one that popped into my mind was the Brady Bunch house. So that has become my memory castle. Um, this technique, by the way, was generated, was, um, de was developed by ancient Greek orators who would give these really long lectures, tell really long stories, and not have any written cues at all. They, it was just from their memory. And uh, they developed the, this technique to help them to remember the parts of their speech or the parts of the story that they were going to tell. And um, so they visualize themselves walking in a, in a familiar location. Um, a lot of times it was like the Greek word agora means, you know, the public space. They picture themselves out in the public space walking down the street. Um, and they would retrieve sections of their speech from behind the pillar and from behind this door. And, you know, like they would tuck um, the things away and walk down the street and collect them as they delivered the speech. If they ever made a mistake, they'd say, oh, I forgot to look behind the rock. <laughs> you know, oh, I left that whole passage behind the rock. Um, so I can't really do that. I mean, the ability to put a whole passage behind a rock doesn't make sense to me. But I can do a very visualizing technique where you can remember very concrete kinds of things. So I'm going to do it for a shopping list because those are concrete items that are easy to visualize. So I'm going to start us off in the kitchen. You can imagine any house you want. You don't have to join me in the Brady Bunch house. You could be in any house you want. Imagine yourself in the kitchen. The constraints of the rules are that you have to have, you know, a table in the kitchen to work with my shopping list, but you don't have to have that for whatever you might want to use this technique for. All right, so we're standing in the kitchen and we look at those upper cabinets over there and we see a waterfall of honey coming out of those upper cabinets and pooling on those nice orange countertops and then running in a rivulet across the kitchen floor. Then we look over at the table and where the um, where the flowers currently are sitting, instead of that, there's a big giant salad bowl and it's full of dog kibble and a dog is on one of the chairs with his front paws on the table and eating the dog kibble out of the bowl. Then we walk into the living room and we um, see that that shag carpet in the living room, as we walk on it, we hear it going under our feet. We look down, we realize it's completely embedded from backing to the tip of that shag carpet with sugar. It's just completely full of sugar. Then we look over at the couch and where those pillows are placed, instead of those pillows are little pyramids of oranges. So there's like this little pile of oranges that are balanced and, and stable and they, it's like they think they're the pillows for the couch. Then we start to walk up the stairs to go to the second floor and on every tread it's lined with slices of bread. Nice fresh slices of bread that we have to walk on to go up those stairs. We go into the bathroom, this happens to be the kids bathroom. They had a Jack and Jill kind of set up and we look into that bathtub and it's full of water 
and then floating in the water like like it's little islands or something are pork chops. There's a bunch of pork chops floating in this bath water and you see like little bits of grease floating in the water. You go into the girls bedroom and you see that um, in the top on top of that um, dresser drawer where that stuffed animal is there the top drawer is open and there's a bottle of milk and it has fallen over and all of the milk has filled that top drawer and all the contents of that top drawer are floating around in the milk. Then you turn to that first bed and you pull back the covers and you discover that somebody has taken an entire bag of chips, crunched them up and s spread them all over uh, on the sheet and then made the bed on top of it so that whoever goes to bed that night is going to have a bed full of crunched up potato chips to clean up. All right, that is your shopping list. Now what I like to do in class is make you shout it out, but I'll never know if you shouted it out. So I will pause and give you a second to shout out and then I will remind you. So we're going to start our shopping list. So we look over at the cupboards and that reminds us that we need to buy honey. We look at the table and it reminds us we need to get dog kibble. We start walking in the living room and we remember we need to get sugar. The couch reminds us that we need oranges. The stair treads remind us that we need bread. The bathtub reminds us of pork chops. The dresser, milk. The bed, potato chips. So for all those times that you forget your grocery list and you're like, man, and I, of course, serial position effect always happens with grocery lists. So you remember the first few things that you wrote down. You remember the last couple things and it's that thing in the middle that you forgot. Try a memory castle next time. And instead of writing it down, just go ahead and say, I'm going to commit this to memory and I'm going to make these associations. And you'll notice I gave you kind of outlandish associations. I didn't say simple things like there's a bowl of oranges on the dining room table, so don't forget to get oranges. Um, it has to be kind of an outlandish, outlandish visualization because then it'll be distinctive and you'll remember it. Um, so try that the next time you're making a list. Not too long of a list. I didn't give you too many things. I think there was maybe 10. Let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, okay, eight things that I gave you to remember. Um, you don't want to do it for a list where you're you know, storing up for the next six months of, you know, like maybe just do it on a, a quick jaunt to the to the store. Um, but it's a great strategy and it really does work. I personally have found that it works really well for concrete things like grocery items. Um, it is possible if you want to to try and do it for something abstract like giving a speech or something like that. Now like the orator said, oh I might forget to look behind a rock. What if you forgot to go into the kids bathroom and look at the bathtub as you're at the grocery store and you're remembering that you need to buy your list. If you forget what your path was and you miss a step, yeah, you're going to forget the pork chops in that case, right? Um, so you want to make sure that if you're going to use this technique, you know what your route is going to be. And ideally, make it the same route every time so that you always know to walk in these certain places and look in these certain places. And then the things that you're buying take on different roles within those spaces. The peg te word technique works really well, especially for lists that it matters what the order is. Um, what I usually like to do before explaining it is demonstrate it in class. So what I usually do in class is have students yell out concrete nouns. Um, and I, I ask them not to do people or places, but just concrete nouns. So things, any kind of thing. And um, so we get a list of 10 and I have a student write it up on the board. What, you know, they'll put number one and then what the students generated and that, that way. And I have my back to the to the board so I don't cheat and um, I use the peg word technique to remember the list of words. So in this technique you're going to first thing before you ever start is you memorize this list of pegs. So one is a bun, two is a shoe, three is a tree, four is a door and so on. Um, they actually have pegs all the way up to number 20. I only do 10 item lists whenever I demonstrate this. Um, but you, if you wanted to you could you could remember a longer list using this technique. Um, a lot of these you probably already have memorized because maybe you know that old nursery rhyme where you go one, two, buckle my shoe, three, four, shut the door, right? Um, so you probably have half of these already memorized. Memorize the other half and then now you can take concrete objects 
and associate them with the objects. Okay, so let's say um, a student generates um, headphones as the first thing that they want me to remember. My job would be to generate a visualization where the headphones and the bun are interacting in, again, the more distinctive way, the better. So the first thought that comes to my mind is that I've got um, like Beats headphones on, but instead of the earpieces, they're hamburger buns, right? So one is a bun, my Beats headphones with buns as the earpieces. Um, maybe number two, they might give me um, flour. And so now I have to associate flour with shoe. Now, since flour is a homophone, I choose to hear it as a thing that grows outside and bees pollinate, not something that you make bread out of. So I choose to believe that that's what they mean. And so I'm going to try and think of some kind of um, association between flour and shoe that would be um, distinctive enough that I'm likely to remember it. So it could be um, shoes with flower print that might, but mm, I don't know. I wouldn't trust myself that I'd remember that. So maybe I want, um, you know, a hollyhock plant, which is a tall, skinny um, plant that's like four feet tall. Um, maybe it can walk and it's wearing shoes. <laughs> so I'm visualizing a hollyhock plant with shoes on its feet walking down the street. And so that's going to help me to remember. Now, the error I might make is instead of saying, um, flower as my response I might say hollyhock and a person might be like why did you why 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 such a specific and it might be because my visualization was too distinct that I pictured a particular kind of flower and that's a, a potential risk with the peg word technique but what I found is that um, at least with lists of 10 on the fly in class I can remember 10 things one trial learning they say it I visualize it, I ask for the next one, they say it, I visualize it, and I can go through it um, immediately with, I'll go through it one time in order, and then I'll tell the students, you can yell out a number and I'll say them out of order. So they'll say, say number three, say number eight, and I hop, I can hop around because inherent in that list is the order of the list, right? Because if I know that the association is between headphones and a bun, I know that's one, because one is a bun. Right. If you know, if I have an association that includes sticks, I know that's item number six. Um, so if the order of the items is important, and sometimes it is, in psychology, um, most majors have to take a physiological psych class, and you in that class have to memorize the twelve nerves, twelve cranial nerves, and the order of the nerves matters. Um, the peg word technique is a great way to try and um, remember the, the names of those nerves. Now, of course, nerves, those names are abstract. And so you might have to do a secondary technique. And I'll, I'll, I'll um, remember to mention that when I get to, down here on the semantic encoding. So the peg word technique, I can't advocate that one too much. That one's an awesome one. There are lots of different semantic, semantic encoding ta uh, tasks that you can do. Um, you know, you're going to be able to remember material better if you process it for meaning. So it's always going to be a mnemonic technique. So um, some specific semantic mnemonics. How about the first letter technique where you take the first letter of the words that you're remembering and you make words out of it. So like Roy G. Biv is a an acronym that will help you to remember red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet, right? Um, Again, this has the benefit of having um, order inherent in it because this helps you remember these in the order of the rainbow. So that's actually a really big benefit to this also. Um, Roy G. Biv is an acronym. FBI is not an acronym. That's an initialization. Uh, uh, an, to be an acronym, uh, it needs to be pronounceable. So SCUBA is an acronym. Uh, CIA is not. Uh, so just a little tip there. Here's um, how to remember the order of the planets. My very educated mother just served us na nachos. I just, I have a hard time because I memorized it back when Pluto was a planet. And so I want a really strong response instead of nachos. I wanted to say nine pizzas, um, but I have to remember the new thing stops with nachos, not nine pizzas. Um, but these are really good ways to take just the first letter of the item to be remembered make a word out of it and um, 
if you can remember that sentence, it should trigger you to be able to go back and remember the item, right? It doesn't work perfectly, but it's, it's a good idea. Now the keyword method is when you have more abstract terms, like here we have Broca's area, parietal lobe, hypothalamus, and you're trying to remember these terms. Um, you can take the, um, the meaning of the word or the way the word sounds, whatever, however it works, and make a mental picture based on the meaning of that term. So Broca's area directs the muscles for speech production, so their recommendation is to, to imagine breaking a talking doll. If it gets broken, which sounds kind of like Broca, it won't talk anymore. It can't produce speech anymore, right? And so having um, this meaningful, but it's also still an image, right? Imagine breaking a talking doll, um, but you have to tell yourself, okay, because now that it's broken, it can't talk. Now that it's Broca, <laughs> it can't talk. Um, this is what you can do with the cranial nerves, right? You can take those cranial nerves and you can kind of look at how they sound, consider how they sound. Um, for example, there's a vagus nerve. It's not spelled the same way as Las Vegas. Vegas is spelled, but you could treat it as though it were and then build that into your pegword technique, right? So now you have a visualization of Las Vegas and that's going to remind you about the vagus nerve. So you can kind of mix and match some of these strategies to make material more memorable. Um, so, oh, my computer decided it wanted to be slow. The last thing I wanted to mention is the reason why jingles are so powerful. And I have a jingle loaded up for you to be able to watch as your final thing in this in case you've never seen it before. It's, it's pretty funny. We were all singing it back in the day. Um, but jingles are really um, powerful because they are taking advantage of tunes which naturally lead you from one note to the next and you make an association between a word and a note and next thing you know you're saying the words in the same order because the words will lead you one to the next and now you have memorized it and a lot of times very easily like you haven't even had to necessarily try and you can pick it up and then all you need is like the first two notes and off you go and you can start saying whatever you were trying to remember when my kids were little, I really wanted them to be able to say their address in case they ever got lost. I wanted them to be able to report their address. And so um, I taught it to them in a little jingle. I'm not even sure what the what the tune was that I, I get. I can't tell you what song this really is, but I was like, um, gosh, I don't. So I'll say it's an old address from a long time ago, but it, it was like one eight seven one four nine you know, like that and they were singing the number that we lived um, in an area that didn't have names on the streets right so we, it was all numbers so they'd say their the five digit um, you know address their street name avenue right and then what city they lived in um, I figured if you got lost you probably are in the same state you're a little kid <laughs> You're probably in the same state. Um, so I taught it to him in a song and my daughter picked it up really fast and she could just spontaneously do it. But when my son got to be about that age, he needed to kickstart. So I'd say, do you remember your address song? And he'd say, uh, kind of can't do it. I'd say the first couple of notes and then he could do it. And I thought, well, I don't think anybody who finds you if you get lost is going to know to kickstart you with a couple of notes. So I'm not sure he really knew his address, but, um, if you have the first couple of notes of a jingle, you can then say all the things, and you know this with songs, right? As soon as you hear the first couple of notes, you can sing that whole song. Um, and that's a really powerful memory technique also. So try putting things to songs. Since I already sang a, an address, I'll give you an example from um, a, an old sitcom from the 80s. It was called Cheers. And this um, character was doing his GED at night. And so he was trying to remember his world geography. And so he made a song where he's, and I remember the stupid song. He's like, um, Albania, Albania, you border on the Adriatic, right? Like that's a really good way to re remember details about something that you, um, that you have to memorize that maybe has multiple lines. He, uh, it had another line. All I remember is that it wrapped up with, and your chief export is crude. <laughs> That's all I really remember from it. But um, 
what a memorable way to encode things that otherwise you might not have encoded. So, and simple songs. Um, the one that I started to sing with an address, the one that, that he was singing, I can't even, I know those tunes. I know what they are, but I'm not, I, I can only think of them as jingles anymore. Um, they can become very powerful memory techniques. That's all I can say. So enjoy the Big Mac song. If you've never heard it before, it's pretty funny. We were all singing it back in the day. Um, and I will see you in the next chapter.